right, everyone. Thank you so much for coming uh, to the first <coughs> of our spring speaker series about the unwritten archaeology and oral history of Jim Crow Mobile. And today's talk is Down the Bay, Archaeology and Oral History. And I wanted to introduce our speakers. So first we have uh, Dr. Phil Carr who serves as, the, serves as the Chief Calvin McGee Professor of Native American Studies, Professor of Anthropology, and Director for the Center of Archaeological Studies. He grew up enjoying finding things and finding things out, and with a passion for learning about the in, indigenous people of the United States. Becoming an archaeologist, investigating the human past, and working with Native peoples of the Southeast U.S., People who live on the Gulf Coast, students and colleagues, bring him great joy. Rachel Hines is the Public Outreach Coordinator for the Center for Archaeological Studies. She earned a Master's in Historical Archaeology from the University of West Florida. She has a decade of experience as an archaeologist in different parts of the country and is most passionate about connecting communities with local cultural resources. Dr. Marini is the Director of Community Oral History Collections at the Doyle, Doy Leal McCall Rare Book and Manuscript Library here at the University. So please give a very big welcome to our guests and I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here on this uh, somewhat gloomy Tuesday, April afternoon. Um, and I do hope you'll get a chance to see the exhibit if you haven't had a chance to, to see it already. Um, I'm Phil Carr of the TRIO, and um, I want to get us started, and I'm going to give the 10,000-foot view. I think Ryan's going to give about a 1,000-foot view, and I think Rachel said she was going to give the one-foot view. So we'll see if we can get through the, our different views. Um, so. Mobile, Alabama, City in Motion. So in 1968, William Graves um, wrote a National Geographic magazine article about Mobile, right? So um, 50 uh, years ago plus, we had this article and focused on Mobile as a city in motion. And you can see in the upper right here, the I-10 uh, bridge, uh, excuse me, well the I-10 I is beginning to sneak, uh, snake through there in the, the part of the, the photo and then of course we have traffic on the Mobile River. Um, fast forward to today and everybody knows the trouble with I-10 and Mobile, so arguably we're no longer a city in motion. <laughs> but we can fix that. Um, the Alabama Department of Transportation has proposed a new bridge for I-10, and this is one uh, rendering of what that bridge might look like. And in order to build that bridge, um, they're going to have to impact a, a relatively small area, uh, when you consider the scope of this project, being that much of it will be up in the air. So the question becomes, why do archaeology? So archaeology, oral history, Jim Crow Mobile, bridge. And so I'm going to, again, 10,000 foot view. So I'm going to do the do's and don'ts of archaeology. And, and, and I could put, you know, Merit on, on uh, you know, she's in the audience and she should know this. You want to give us a, a don't, Merit, of archaeo for archaeology? No? <laughs> all right, archaeologists don't dig for dinosaurs, all right, so if you're looking for photos of fossils, you're not going to see any here. We don't just work in Egypt or Greece, uh, we can work anywhere that there have been people in the past right here in Sweet Home, Alabama. And we don't dig for treasure. I have not seen the latest movie, but um, they tell me I should. I don't know. <laughs> so archaeologists don't do those three things, what do we do? We try to reconstruct culture history. We want to answer the questions, who was where when, reconstruct past life ways, how and what was life like in the past, and explain culture change. Why do things change? Um, 
Why do things change technologically? Why do things change culturally, socially, politically, and so forth? And one archaeologist, Bob Kelly, has recently written a book called The Fifth Beginning, What Six Million Years of Human History Can Tell Us About Our Future. So Bob's argument is, is that by investigating cultural change, we add relevance to archaeology because we can actually look to our future and looking to our past, uh, much younger me in 1987 with Bob Kelly, you can tell the professor and their status, they get to sit in the shade when you're in the field. Um, and in Nevada, you have to bring your own shade to the field, right? So those are four by six pieces of plywood and shovels propping them up. Uh, but that was a different time. So, in Bob's book, he argues there have been four beginnings in human history. The beginning of technology, the beginning of culture, the beginning of agriculture, and the beginning of civilization or the state. And for Bob, these beginnings mean that human cultural evolution happened in such a way that everything changed. So it was um, integrated throughout all of the cultures that, 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 and, and peoples that went through these, these beginnings. So he argues that we're in the midst of a fifth beginning and that archaeology helps, helps us learn about that potential fifth beginning. So that's why we need archaeology, or, or excuse me, that's why we do archaeology. We, we want to learn about the past so we can better understand our present and then hopefully shape our future. So why do we need archaeology, particularly why might we need archaeology with a bridge? And the answer is the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. So you know, uh, the US government uh, decided that we were losing important historic places, particularly in uh, urban areas, um, and that we needed to protect those places. And they created a National Register of Historic Places. And part of, the, of that um, is you have to look to make sure there's no properties within a federal undertaking uh, that could be eligible for the National Register. And for the I-10 bridge, we found 15 sites that are eligible for the National Register. So this is the project uh, <coughs> length of uh, I-10. Most of our archaeological sites, the thir 13 and the 15 are on the um, Mobile side. And we have two sites on the Baldwin County side. So we need archaeology, we do archaeology, and then you know what is the value of archaeology? And, and I'm gonna come bring you sort of quickly to the three conclusions that we, we have. And you've seen some photos of, of the field work. Um, and, and I should just say that the presentation that I'm giving today is uh, drawing upon a wide variety of collaborations. Uh, Wiregrass Archaeological Consulting, one of those collaborators. We could not have done this project without them, the staff of the Center for Archaeological Studies, and, and Howard Sear of Geo Archaeological Solutions. So a lot of folks went into to this. And also to say that the lab work is still ongoing. So we don't have a finished product yet, but we were still able to incorporate some of our findings in the unwritten exhibit. So flashback 50 years again to that National Geographic article um, and the dilemma for facelifters, how to renovate Mobile yet retain her venerable charm. So that's one of the reasons that we do archaeology is we want, again, to, to we recognize the importance of the past. And if Mobile has a venerable charm, we don't want, want to lose it. So, so that was a quote from, from, one of, from the article. So just uh, before I turn it over to, to Ryan, three things that the archaeology have shown, some of which might seem obvious, but I think they're, they're worth pointing out. At the majority of the archaeological sites that we investigated, we found evidence of the indigenous people of um, Alabama. So the, the native peoples of, of, of Alabama, the, the, the Choctaw in particular, we have evidence that this land was theirs. They were here first, um, so to speak, and that the 
they left um, objects on the landscape that, that tell us that they were here, and that's on both the Baldwin side and the Mobile side. Tremendous landscape changes. Again, that may seem obvious. We have all this built environment in downtown Mobile, but what we may not realize, and what I didn't realize, is that if you're at the um, uh, terminal, the cruise terminal um, for the, the cruise ship, you're standing on 16 feet of filter. So that landscape would have been drastically different in 1700. Um, and still different still if we go back earlier than that. And not only is it fill dirt, so human um, modification of that landscape, we also have Mother Nature. So we have evidence of hurricanes in, in the form of clean sand in our soil profiles that our geoarchaeologists interprets as evidence for past hurricanes and we hope to be able to get some dates on those to tie those to specific hurricane events and lastly we have documented evidence of significant cultural changes some of those changes happened during the 20th century we are no longer um, living with the specifics of Jim Crow though we we, we did still live with the legacy of it. So there has been change and there's room for more change. So the past does inform our present and hopefully can, it can um, help us shape the future. So published and she's holding it right there. Uh, this history really means a lot. Miss Marjorie, and so I'll start with her clip. Please let me know if it's not loud enough. It was instilled in no. us. Okay. You are somebody. And because you're somebody, you can be anything you want to be. And that was instilled in us. And so that came from down the bay from the elders. You knew your place, you stayed in it. You didn't get outside your place. But we were always told, it doesn't have to be this way forever, that you can come up out of this and you can make it. When we would see people leave the bay and come back and have made it, then that was an incentive for us to strive to do better and try to make it. And everybody that left the bay, they did come back and they were greeted. When they took the bay from us in 19, and all of that in 1968, we still at the Texas Street reunion down the bay. Everybody would come back and gather for the reunion. And it's usually done around July the 4th. That's that Down the Bay reunion that we had. And anybody from Down the Bay during that era would come. Okay? And I'm proud of Down the Bay because of the people, as I listed them, some of them that went on to become, you know, known. And we're proud of that because it was from Down, down the Bay. And this did happen in this little secluded community that they destroyed, never to be regained. Now, the destruction that Miss Marjorie is describing is urban renewal combined with the original building of I-10 um, from the well, from the uh, National Geographic article, article that Dr. Carr was sharing earlier. Uh, incidentally, all of the housing board records from Urban Rule are archived at the McCall, and that's where we found a number of photographs we've been able to share back with the community. Um, so I'll, I'll go to Jamie Hobbs now. Uh, Do you remember what was Oh, yes. 
uh, especially at Christmas. They used to go up on Texas Hill, and there must have been, I mean, 200 children. And there was no fighting and no cutting and no cussing, and they would skate all over the community co collectively. Yes, at Christmas. Yes. So that was as big as people who said it was? Yes, 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 yes. And I also remember uh, Mardi Gras down the bay. Everybody would cook and people would go from house to house. And families came home. It was a homecoming. And um, like I said, you go to the house, come on, have something to eat. Every, you offer people, if you saw them and they looked hungry, you offered them food. Uh, it's not that way. And I remember that if someone died, Someone in the community would get a car, someone would get together, uh, people to take food on different nights. Educated people know about these things. So that you wouldn't all bring the same food. And it was always like that. Someone from the community would get the flowers. We don't do that anymore. We don't do that anymore. I remember my mother taught at Williamson High School. There was a young lady. Her father found out she was pregnant and he beat her. She came to our house. My parents took her in. And my mother contacted her mother to let her know she was there, but the father was still raving. Mr. Lemuel K. Kibi was the principal called my mother. He said, Miss Reddick, you cannot keep that child at your house. My mother explained she was fearful that he would continue. Mr. Keeby came and picked her up and it's 38. He said, I'm going to go to the house and I assure you, Miss Ray, he will not put his hands on her. That's the way the community was. So you talk about community. The black community was invested in every single member of that community. We don't have that. You would be walking home from school. If a fight ensued, four or five people, men and women, come out and break it up. And then they tell you, who's your mom? I'm calling that house. You better get home, and I better not see this again. We were all invested in our well-being. If a dog came out and ran after you, somebody would come out with a stick and drive that dog away. You didn't have to know them. You didn't have to be kin to them. Because it was the adults in the community's responsibility to protect every child in that community. And it hurts me that we don't have that anymore. We don't have that anymore. So I'll let Ms. Hobbs have the last word on that, and I'll pass it along to Rachel. Okay. Tough time to follow. Ms. <laughs> Hobbs. <laughs> um, so I'm Rachel Hines, and I'm the oops, public outreach coordinator um, at the Center for Archaeological Studies, and I'm trained as an archaeologist, but this is my favorite job um, because my whole role here is just to share the amazing work that Bill and Ryan and all the others on this project are doing. Um, and so I kind of think of the archaeology that Bill just shared and the oral history that Ryan just shared as my raw materials, and I get to put them together to come up with stories. And so like Bill said, I take the one foot view and I'm always looking um, to find what kind of stories we can tell through all this information that we're collecting um, that can be relatable and resonate with people. Um, and so that's um, the archaeology and the oral history, they really have what they have in common is they're both unwritten sources. Um, and so they can tell these stories that other written sources don't really have to offer. And for various reasons, different stories aren't written down, but um, yeah, we're able to capture them and bring them out. And so that's kind of the basis of this exhibit that's around us right now. Um, and when I very first started my role as the public outreach coordinator, um, uh, I was kind of overwhelmed with how much we had going on because this project is so huge. And this is a picture of um, 
our I-10 uh, Mobile River Bridge sites here in Mobile on the Mobile side in red. Um, and then around it, those different colored polygons are all different boundaries for down the bay that people have given in oral history interviews. So it kind of depends who you're talking to and kind of what time period they're thinking of. Um, but as you can see, our sites fell within most of those boundaries of down the bay, not all of them. Um, especially the one that's bound by I-10 because as Phil and Ryan mentioned, um, when I-10 came through, it really um, transformed the community. Um, and so when I came in, I was looking for a story from one of these sites and the very first site that was excavated was called the Virginia Street site, um, which is way down at the bottom there. It's our southernmost site named because it's on Virginia Street. Um, and I was looking at this site. Um, this is uh, kind of a zoomed in version of the site in 1955. So you can see there's the blue, um, the red shape is our site boundary. All those other shapes inside are the work that we did archeologically. Um, and so at the northern part of the site, there's this bottling works, this is Pepsi, well actually it's a great pet bottling company, but later Pepsi, um, and then at the bottom, these cluster of houses, and particularly that one in the middle, um, we did a lot of work around there. And so I started looking at the documents to see who was living there, because one of the most amazing things about doing archeology span in an urban area like Mobile is we can figure out who actually used the items that we're excavating. So a lot of times with archeology, span um, particularly when we are studying a past before written records, we don't know exactly who these people were that were using the things that we're studying. Um, but yeah, when we're in an urban area, and particularly in our recent past, we have access to city directories and census records and amazing maps like this. And so we can pinpoint exactly who these things belong to, which is just such a rare opportunity. Um, and so I started looking at who lived at this house. And fortunately, um, one of the people that lived there had a really distinct name, Jesse Owens. Not um, the famous Jesse Owens, but um, a Jesse Owens from um, Mobile. And so it really stood out to me year after year I was seeing it. Um, maybe a name that wasn't Jesse Owens. Maybe I wouldn't have even made the connection, but um, I saw him year after year and realized that this family, the Owens family, lived in this home for over 60 years and through three generations. So they have people, um, yeah, parents, uh, kids, and then grandkids all living in that home at different times. Um, and so I was like, well, this is my story. Like, this is my one foot view. Um, and so I spent a lot of time researching who they were and looking at the archeology span from this site, um, yeah, to kind of narrow down in something that was a relatable scope. and. Um, so when I was asked to help with this exhibit, the unwritten exhibit, Phil and Jen had gotten a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to put this together, and they had written in that they wanted to look at fam or that they wanted to look at the archaeology of Africa Town down the bay and um, the area around the avenue, and so I already knew we had the Owens family, and I said, well, let's find like similar family units because that takes our scale from that 10,000 foot view down to that one foot view and that we can actually fit in this one room. Um, and so that's kind of how um, this was born, that we've got these three families and it's just such a relatable concept. Everyone has a family, even if it looks um, different, we all have some kind of concept of what a family is and um, documents that are there, but you might not think to look them up in the documents unless we already have this opportunity with the archeology. span um, so they purchased their home in 1897. They were from Georgia. Um, they were just a little nuclear family, Jesse and Lily, and their children, Nathan and Queenie. Um, and Jesse, in the documents, worked for the L N Railroad for over 35 years, and then Lily was listed as a dressmaker. Um, but what's really cool is when you start digging, they actually had these other income sources that they were supplementing their regular income as well. Um, and so on the left there, I have a map of that parcel of land between Virginia and North Carolina Street. You can see there's a J. Owen and a J. Owens a couple times. Um, so they actually own multiple parcels of land on this block. Um, and one, the bottom one there in the lower right-hand corner, um, they subdivided and 
at some times they were renting two houses out on those lots, um, at some times they were renting one out and then one of their children moved into that house. Um, and so being able to invest in real estate, I mean, that was huge for them as an extra income source. Um, and then another, um, Another endeavor that they took on was that they had a house attached, or a store attached to their home, um, and we can see it in some of the maps, and we also found this one city directory listing of Jesse as a grocer um, in 1907. Um, and at that time, it was really common to have grocery stores on almost every corner, um, like neighborhood stores. And so that was important for the community because this is places where people would buy groceries um, and people in the oral history remember people being more generous, having line of credit and things like that that we wouldn't imagine having today at a grocery store. Um, but it was also really important during this Jim Crow era um, because this was a way for African American families to generate their own income, be their own boss. Um, and so in a lot of our case studies that we have on the wall here, you see all these different income sources because people were hustling to make a good life for themselves and provide for their families. Um, and so that's kind of what we can learn from the documents. We can learn a little bit about who they are um, and what they did, but archaeology really has the opportunity to tell us more about what their lives were like and kind of flesh out um, flush out these documents. So this is um, another map. This is the 1915 Sanborn Fire Insurance map. And up at the top there, that's 906 South Franklin Street where the Owens family live. Um, and the little S on that little rectangle, that's our store that was attached to their home. Um, but what was really exciting was there was a line of post holes that kind of perfectly lined up with the same measurements of what their house was. Um, so we could figure out where that house was on the landscape. Um, and behind their house was this feature 124, which was this huge trash pit. Um, we've got a picture of it in the exhibit too. It had over 3,000 artifacts in it. So just like chock full of information about what kind of choices they were making, what kind of foods they were eating, what kind of medicines they were using. I mean, all kinds of information about what life looked like for them. Um, and like Phil said, we're still processing the artifacts from these sites, and so there are still so many stories left to tell us um, in this trash pit, but we had to pick one out for this exhibit, and one question that came to mind was, we found like so many of these whole whiskey bottles, which is just kind of unusual, um, like more than you would expect, and you can actually see some in the profile sticking out um, of the trash pit. And so one thing, um, that we can do to try to narrow down when we've got a question like that is to go to the oral history and look for some answers. And unfortunately, um, I haven't been able to track down any descendants from the Owens family. Um, they moved to Ohio and I've sent some letters up there, but I haven't heard anything back. So um, if you know anyone, let me know. Um, <laughs> but um, I sent them everything that I had, so, <laughs> so I want them to know. Um, but we can look to other people's um, oral histories to just learn more about what life was like in the neighborhood. And um, one that came up a lot was a hit house, which is a place where um, liquor is kind of sold, um, <laughs> uh, is sold under the radar um, and where people can go after hours to have fun. Or um, And so this actually, could have been what it was, we don't know for sure, but if it was, it was probably a, yet another source of income for this family. Um, so, but, if, so if you could have... I could just start up like that. Um, but here is the quote that we picked out for the exhibit, um, talking about hit houses from Cedric Anthony. Imagine, hit house is where uh, after the clubs have closed, everything is shut down, the hit house is always open, always open. You can go in there and sell them liquor, cheap, uh, entertainment, dancing, whatever. So it might not be the, um, the answer that we're looking for, but maybe it is. And so it gives us these little clues um, and kind of fills out our concept of what life was like or what the archaeology actually means. Um, and so I'm looking forward to, as we continue processing the artifacts, finding more so, opportunities. Um, to tell those types of stories or at least get those kinds of ideas to get your imagination going. I think that's what's um, fun about it. It makes these things that look kind of like dry, 
you know, bottles and things like that into something with a story behind it. Um, so th fast forward through time, the Owens family ends up having four sons. Um, they live in the area at various times. They return to this house at 906 South Franklin Street. And then as um, Bill and Ryan have talked about, in the 1960s, I-10 was constructed um, and their home was basically right on the path of where the interstate was going to go. So this swoop um, on the left side of the screen is the path of the interstate and you can see it goes right through a bunch of people's houses, not through the bottling company or through the Williams Inspection Company, but right through everyone's houses. Um, and so everyone on the block, including the Owens family, um, was forced to leave. And at that time, Jesse Owens' grandson, Clovis Owens, um, was living there and in the house that their family had owned for over six decades, yeah. When you say forced to leave, were their properties forcibly purchased from them or yeah, were they yep. evicted or what happened? <laughs> yep, so basically, um, in this case, they owned their house. So yes, they were, um, forced to sell their houses to the um, Alabama state, yeah, yeah. for I-10. And then um, right on the heels of that, actually, my next perfect segue into my next map, um, this is an image that we created for the exhibit. Um, and right on the heels of I-10 was a slew of urban renewal projects mm -hmm. um, and the construction of the Wallace Tunnel, um, in which even more people were, yeah, forced to sell their homes or a lot of people that rented in this neighborhood, their landlord sold their homes, and so they lost their homes as well. Um, and so I-10, it cuts through the path of about 500 households, I think we tallied up, but just several years later, um, the Texas Street Urban Renewal Project, which was a project of the Mobile City government, um, that reddish polygon, reddish orange, that one forced um, 2,000 households to be relocated, and so, I mean, Businesses closed, people had to move. Yeah, it had a devastating effect on the neighborhood. Um, the neighborhood's still there and people still live there, so you don't say it was like removed or anything, but yeah, a lot of people, it completely was transformed. Um, and um, so I think these stories are really important to tell, not just to call attention um, to what happened. Um, but also to provide kind of a counter narrative to the justifications that were used to do these interstate and urban renewal projects. Um, and so urban renewal was justified, it happened across the country as um, removing slum or dilapidated housing from the landscape. Um, but archeology span and oral history can present a contrasting narrative um, to what people were saying at the time about the community. I mean, people were owning property, they were living com comfortably, they were owning homes. In the archeology, span we found things like flower pots, you know, people had beautifying their spaces, um, things that show what people's lives were like and how they improved themselves, like perfume and cologne and medicines, um, and things that show community, like children's toys and things like that. Um, and so I think, yeah, we have an opportunity not just to show people where this was and what happened to this neighborhood, but also, um, yeah, like <laughs> what life was actually like um, and to make sure that hopefully that things like this don't happen in the future in addition to doing justice up to the past. So if you're interested, um, oh, sorry. I have a question about the map there. Yes. Um, we all know that I-10 going into the Wallace Tunnel has much too sharp a turn. So, is there a particular reason that it was angled that way? Were they only trying to get certain houses? The urban renewal area, what was in there besides houses? Anything else that would have prevented them from taking it in a different direction? Um, so, you mean... What was so the rationale? Yeah, the, the green is the, the wall of tunnel. tunnel. And you're talking and, about... And it, they, make, they just did a terrible oh, job of angling that. <laughs> so it looks to me like they were really trying to avoid some certain areas, and I was just wondering which... Yeah, what is the rationale for going like that? That's just... Okay. Yeah. 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 More questions for our yeah. <laughs> Why is I the way that it is? <laughs>
<laughs> so many questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really sure. And actually, what's interesting is um, we have these plans from the 1950s at the McCall Library that show, yes. like, kind of the concept of I-10 before it was even an interstate, and it was going to be an expressway, and it was going to be even closer to the waterfront, so the opposite direction of what you're thinking. But um, that was kind of before people had conceptualized of interstates and they were just going to make like a bigger highway that went through there on San Manuel Street but um, yeah when they built I-10 for whatever reason they moved it one block over to the left so um, yeah more mysteries to solve I guess but um, <laughs> if you're interested um, in learning more um, my class this semester is Museum Methods and Archaeology, and they've been working all semester on this exhibit growing up down the bay. We're really excited um, to open it on April 26th at the Ben May Library, and we've got some events planned kind of around that um, to try to draw people to the library to see it. So we've got an open house where the students will be there after we install it that day. Um, we've got a couple events on May 9th, the listening session um, with the oral histories, and Take a Break Tuesday or Thursday, which is um, a program that the library does for kids, mostly like K through three. Um, and then a panel similar to this one, if you wanna see us again on May 16th. Um, and I left some brochures on the back table there with all these events if you're interested in coming. Um, and yeah, as always follow us. Um, we try to post on our social media what's going on as well. Um, so that's a good way to keep in touch with us as well. So thank you all so much for being here, and I'm sure there are other questions too, so we'll be here to, to answer them. <laughs>